Hello everyone and welcome back to the Story Nook. Today we're going to be reading responses from r slash ask reddit. And the question is, which cheap and mass-produced item is stupendously well-engineered? The toilet, easy. It is utterly amazing how the device is engineered. If it were designed today, it would be ten times as complex. The toilet does not even need running water. Yes, you hook it up to water, but that, in most toilets, is nothing more than a convenience. Designed to fill the tank up so it can flush. If the water goes out for some reason, you can still use the toilet by filling the basin with a bucket. Why is this? Because the entire toilet's mechanism runs on gravity in most toilets. The water in toilets acts to clean the bowl somewhat and creates a sill that permit prevents sewer gases from entering the home, which means the toilet is a home health device. The toilet is not made of anything advanced. It is made out of fucking porcelain, which is dirt cheap, looks nice, and... Once glazed in its usual white finish, is resistant to chemicals, biological waste, and acids. So, a properly installed toilet can last decades with a relatively pathetic level of maintenance. And I'm just like, very true. I remember, uh, we were, we didn't have water in our house. The water was turned off. And this was a couple of times. And we had buckets we would put outside to gather rainwater in Georgia. And then we would take those up to the toilet and put them in there so we could flush. Very nice. Not sure how bidets work. I've heard good things about them. But yeah. Cardboard remains king. There is a surprising amount of work that goes into designing cardboard boxes. There are folks who enti whose entire career... Are, is based on it. Which is nice. Pins! Especially ballpoint pins and the precision in their balls. Bic had a commercial showing how indestructible they were. They fired a pin into a board and the tip came out the other side. They took the board off and wrote with the exposed pin perfectly. I swear somebody came back in time from humanity's extreme future to fund the, the found the Bic company Clever enough to engineer a ballpoint pen, the disposable lighter, and the disposable safety razor do them all perfectly and quietly change the world. Big changed the design of click pens a couple of years ago. For the worst, sadly, the tips frequently click back in on their own. The pocket hook is too weak, and the blue ink doesn't look as nice. I have to use them at work, and I hate them. Old ones were much better. Very basic rice cookers. They rely on the properties of water not being able to go above 100 degrees Celsius. All, once all the water is gone, it starts heating up past 100 degrees Celsius, and that makes the magnet at the bottom less magnetic, and it clicks over to warming. Or something like that. I'm not an expert, but it is surprisingly simple and effective. Very basic rice cookers is the key word. My family switched over to a more expensive and fancy one a few years back, and it's the worst rice cooker I've ever used. Slow, inefficient, and overcomplicated for the simple task of cooking rice. Contrarily, my very old Tiger rice cooker model with only a single button works perfectly still. Paperclip. It clips paper fairly well, and when combined with a pair of pliers, you can make a number of solutions to a myriad of problems. A friend of mine and I once used one to turn a USB cable into a plastic t into a basic TV antenna. I did that a few years ago, but without the USB. Just straightened out the paper clip and shoved it into the connector where the cable goes and went back to watching hockey. There's a device that can diagnose malaria. It's made of mostly paper and costs less than a dollar. It's been a miracle for poor countries where malaria is common. And they provided a YouTube link. I'm not going to open it. I'm also not recording the screen. I'm just recording my voice. Scissors! Speaking of engineering of scissors, can someone else... Why the same pair of scissors doesn't work for both the right and left-handed people. 
You think that opening and closing of scissors is just a simple up and down motion if you think about it. There's actually a left and right hand, right component of the motion as well. As your thumb and fingers are moving toward each other, they're also slightly pulling the handles away from each other, which has the effect of pushing the two blades together on the other side of the joint. Right-handed scissors use the left hand as the opposite effect. That squeezing motion is pushing the blades away from each other. Yep. Because I have a habit of, because I have left-handed relatives, but uh, I was trained to use my right hand for most things, but I actually don't feel comfortable doing certain tasks with my right hand, so my left hand does those tasks. So, for instance, my mouse on my computer setup goes on my left hand side, so I can draw with my right hand on the tablet, and it just makes sense to put my mouse there. I also grew up with a left-handed mouse connected to a computer. I tend to cut and hold things like scissors and knives in my left hand because they're more comfortable in those hands to do that. I can write a little bit and draw a little bit with my left hand. Not as efficiently anymore because I stopped doing that. I used to switch during high school and middle school and a little bit of college before I could just type. Uh, when my right hand got tired and started hurting, especially in, like, my wrist because of possible carpal tunnel and whatnot, I would go to my left hand to write and draw and do all that because I didn't use it as much, and so I could do it. My handwriting was a little bit messier, but my handwriting in both hands was messy. Now I would have to practice to get it up to par again. Aluminum cans. Transistor. Most made item in the world and changed everything. Fun fact, the head researcher, William Shockley, died alone after pushing away his entire family, destroying his reputation as a researcher, white supremacist, supremacist, and blocking the other two people on the team from working on it further, even though they played an instrumental, instrumental role arguably more than him, in the discovery he took the credit. This is actually wrong. Shockley's research on electrons and holes, confusing topic, but is considered a positively charged electron mathematically, was the reason they tried this in the first place. So that explains why the arguably more than him, until like he took credit, was crossed out. Edit. Walter Brayton and John Bardeen were the two other researchers. If you're looking for a Wikipedia binge, this is a good one. Edit 2. If anyone is curious what a transistor is, is imagine a light bulb hooked up to the two ends of a battery. Now imagine the, that between the light bulb and the battery, you cut the wire and hook those two ends in a T-shaped device. Wire connecting battery to right side of the bulb. Wire connecting battery to the right side of the bulb, battery, the T, and then the light bulb. Single wire connecting the bottom of the T. If you send a positive voltage, think water pressure, to the bottom of the T, the light bulb circuit will start to turn on. If you stop applying the voltage, the current light bulb circuit will stop flowing, the light bulb will turn off. This functionality is the building block of, for computers, but many are needed to even accomplish the simplest of things. For example, one bit of memory requires six transistors. Transistors are used to create logic gates, and logic gates are needed to create flip-flops, which store a singular zero or one. Flip-flops aren't intuitive, so I am not going to attempt to explain that. Which is very interesting. Pencil! And someone responded, John Wick approves. I have never watched a John Wick movie, so someone explains that. Someone also wrote, as does the Joker, I don't get it either, but you know what, I am a simple-minded bitch and I don't watch a lot of TV or movies. A big lighter. It's actually so well thought out if you study it carefully, and competitors can't even copy it or do it better. It's actually an, indig an ingenious little product. And they designed the newly required safety so you can just pull it out and return the lighter to original configuration. 
It's ser- it's seriously such a game changer to take out the safety. So much easier. Yeah, the safety makes it really hard for me to like use my lighter. But I always struggled to get the safety flick out. So every time, because I like to collect lighters with like different designs on them. So I would just take them to a friend and be like, hey, take out the safety on all my lighters for me. Because my hands struggle with things. And someone was quoted, new the required safety. You mean the metal guard they started putting on them like 20 years ago? Please don't make me feel old. I'm, like, not even 30 yet, and I'm just, like, the guard feels like I didn't start seeing that until I was in high school, almost going to college, so I'm just, like, I don't think it's been 20 years. My nieces aren't 20 yet. Well, the younger ones that were born when I was in high school aren't 20 yet, so I'm just, like, don't start with me. The big retractable four-color pens. Lovely smooth barrel, and they never fall fail to retract. I just love the design. They've been my go-to pens for decades. I do love the four four color ch- changing pens. Um, I've had several that have failed to retract, so I don't know if I just had a cheaper version and it wasn't big or what. But yeah, I remember I somehow got one when I was in high school and thought it was the coolest thing ever. Used it for several years. My most favorite memory with it, though, was my senior year English class. Our teacher had us write a journal every entry every day. She put a topic on the board, and we had to write for about 10 minutes or so. I started getting bored doing it and started using each color ink, with each color being a different personality. I would randomly switch colors, sometimes at the end of a sentence, sometimes in the middle, and that would be a different person. She would collect the journals at the end of the week to read through to make sure we were actually writing and grade them. They weren't worth much towards the overall grade and would always write a note in mind saying she enjoyed reading them. I had an English teacher that did something similar, which was nice. Um, She would, it was not high school, it was middle school, it was my seventh grade year. No, it was my sixth grade year. And she would like, write a partial sentence and we had to finish that sentence and like make like a short little story we had like 10 or 5 minutes to do so and if we wanted we could come read up read it to the class I really enjoyed it and it was probably one of the few times I spoke (laughs) because I wasn't very vocal but I enjoyed reading what I wrote and sharing what I wrote so it made me happy someone else commented big lighters never had a bad one and I've been using them at least the last 40 years Back when I was smoking, it was evident how much more reliable they were than pretty much any other lighter out there. Now that I don't smoke, I still swear by their generic ballpoint pens, also more reliable than most other pen. Yeah, I collect lighters because I really like candles and I like the art on them. Also, my mom's a smoker and a lot of people in my family are smoking. Like, I used to, um, for those of you who don't smoke, uh, there's a thing called packing your cigarettes. And it's where you take your pack of cigarettes and you'll, like, tap them, like, hit them on the ground or your wrist to, like, pack the tobacco deeper into your cigarette or something. And you would do that with the box or, like, the whole carton like my mom did. And I got really good at doing that and I never smoked. But my sister, who did, she would just hand me her pack of cigarettes when she bought them and said, hey, pack this for me. (laughs) And I was really good at doing that on my wrist. And, like, I remember seeing them all argue over who stole the other one's bo- uh, uh, Bic lighter, because those things were fucking important, and they all only had one, and there was always one friend who would pocket the lighter, and then everyone would be pissed, because where did a good lighter go? Someone says, the MOSFET. I worked at Metal Corp back in the 80s. The problem with MOSFETs in the old day was they had a really low switching speed because the surrounding substrate had to drain all its charge before the FET would switch states. Mike Coplin, who now owns Coral, came up with the idea of putting each transistor into an isolated cell of isolated substrate. This greatly reduced the amount of charge required by each transistor, sped up the switching speed, and most importantly reduced the generated heat. This 
ISO CM dash CMOS allowed Mitchell to redesign the office telephone system PBX so that instead of being in refrigerator sized cabinets in an air conditioned room, it would be in a box the size of an office fridge that you could put anywhere. In five years, Mitchell grew to have 50% of the North American market for office phone systems, and both Mike Couplin and his co-founder Terry Matthews are now billionaires. I struggle to read all of that. And someone responds, and this is going to be a lot of words that I am going to stumble over. Be nice to me. I own two of the competition's refrigerator size PBXs and Northern Telecom SG-1. Yes, it was enormous, but it doesn't require its own air-conditioned room. It wasn't enormous because of lack, lack of soft sets, of MOS sets. It was enormous because of a very low level of integration. It used hard wire, lo hard wire logic in a full system contained over a thousand 74XX series TTL logic ICs. The SX200 was small because it was able to take advantage of an innovation that wasn't available when Nortel began developing the SG-1 in 1969, the microprocessor. And I'll hand it to Mattel, their analog matrix ICs were the cat's meow, but unfortunately they represented a brief moment in the development of electronic telephone switching. Even before the SX2000 came out in the 1970, 1976, Nortel proved that, on go, that going all digital was a viable way forward for the PBX market in 1975, so the brief lead Mattel did have, the brief lead Mattel ha, did have very quickly evaporated, so I thought ISO-CMOS came from Siltec, not Mike Coplin. And there's going to be more stuff. Someone says the clothespin, zipper. Zippers are very nice. Uh, I've had several zippers break on me or just get caught and stuff and try struggling to fix them. But they are nice. Swanson Speed Square. I have no idea what that is. Nail clippers! That That is a very good invention. Thank you for being so simple and easy. I had to buy a pack of those and just put them around my house. One for each desk. So, like, we would have some. Because we apparently have lost some. Bicycle! There is a recent invention for kids' bikes where a single brake lever applies brakes to both wheels only when the rear has resistance from the ground. The moment the rear loses contact with the ground, the front... Disengages, preventing you from going over the handlebars. Still miss the non-lever brakes. I just turn the thing backwards. Turn the thing backwards. The only problem is I'm really short. The bike I have is like two inches too tall for me. So it's hard for me to keep my balance on it. Gauge blocks. Little flat precision machine metal block sheets that can be combined into different combinations to get extremely precise measurements, e.g. with a set of 30 blocks, one may create any of the 1,000 links from 3.000 to 3.999 millimeters in steps of 0.001 millimeter or 0.3000 to point 0.3999 inches to in 0 0.1 in 0 0.0001 inch steps. That, that is a lot of numbers that was very hard for me to read and say. They are so extremely precise that they can sometimes be hard to separate from each other because of a combination of vacuum and mole molecular adhesion. They are used for calibrating machines and measuring devices. You can get some low-quality 10-piece ones for about $30 for DIY applications. Industrial-quality ones are about $10,000 for a basic set. I did not follow any of that. If anyone can explain that to me better. I don't know if I just read it aloud and kind of got it or just 
what? It, it was just complicated for me. Years ago, a question like this came up, and apparently chemical smell engineers' minds were blown not once but twice by Febreze. First, they designed it to remove smells, pretty crazy, but the focus groups didn't like the lack of smell. So they had to design a scent that could get around the smell-killing thing that they had just invented. Apparently, this blows people's minds even more. Are you saying the remove smell part is real and not just marketing BS? I've always assumed it's just masking previous smells. The active ingredient in several Febreze products is hydropropyl beta cyclodextrin HP, I believe that's SEP, that's what I remember being called in German class, CD. The molecule traps and binds volatilized hydrocarbons within its constructural ring, retaining malodorosis molecules, which reduces their vo vol volatility and thus the perception of their scent. The active ingredient is produced from corn cobs. The use of cyclodextrin as a sprayable odor absorber was patented by Procter and Gamble. The perfumes used in Febreze products will therefore need to not be hydrocarbons, oils, etc. Great. Now I'm both impressed and also mad about another patent. And so, yeah. And then someone else says, the velvet hook and loop commonly referred to as Velcro. Powerful bonding. <laughs> nice to know that. They're not too cheap, but eyeglasses. Before them, humans had bad eyesight. With bad eyesight, were just screwed for their entire lives. And that is true. I have bad eyesight. If I didn't have glasses, I would not be able to drive. I would not be able to, like, really read. Unless it's, like, really close to my face. I would struggle to do a lot of things. Like, I don't even think I would be able to cook with how bad my eyes are. Because, like, it's so hard to do anything without my glasses. Bobby pins! And then someone says bubble wrap. But we're at 24 minutes of recording, so I'm going to go ahead and end this recording here. Thank you all for being here, for listening. Have a great day. Stay hydrated. All that good stuff. Um, and I'll see you next time. Uh, special thanks to my Patreon, YouTube, and Kofi supporters, Kaleidoscope Chick and Micah. You guys are awesome. And so, yeah. Uh, stay safe. Stay hydrated. Thank you all for being here. Hopefully you enjoyed the art. Share uh, what you think and all that other good stuff. Bye-bye.